Hello learners, in this unit on functional forms of architecture, the focus of this video will be with the following objectives. First, we will focus on the growth and evolution of architecture and we will try to understand the functional aspects of various moment, monuments which are traceable from ancient times. After going through this uh, unit, you will become aware about the functional utility of numerous monuments spread over time, relevance of a monument for its society and importance of a particular kind of architecture prevalent in specific regions. Learners, architecture is an art and science of building construction. As a science, it develops various methods and techniques by which open space can be covered for different purposes. It is a science which deals with space. Architecture is also conditioned by the available building material because it is the kind of building material that determines the durability of the building and the cost factor. The other aspect of architecture is the fine arts involved. Building activity to a great extent is influenced by the aesthetics of the region also. An important factor in any architectural activity is its utility. It is this feature which determines the use. The purpose also plays a crucial role in the determination of a particular kind of style for a building. In the previous units, we have discussed in detail about the art and science of architectural activity. In this video, we shall make an endeavor to understand the architectural activity through its utility. It should be kept in mind that while identifying a particular building, that it can be classified in different categories as a building can perform one or more than one function. So, in this unit, we have classified the architectural activities into five categories. These are first residential, second religious, third ceremonial, fourth strategic and fifth public utility. So, I will be discussing with you all these categories one by one. Now, let us first focus on residential category of architecture. The construction of houses of non-perishable material was confined mainly to the cities in ancient times. Even in cities like perishable material like wood was extensively used. We have few examples of residential architecture from ancient period, but we have enough textual references available from the medieval period. Apart from the caves used by hunters and gatherers, the first information about residential architecture in India came from Harappan civilization. The settlements of Harappa, Mohenjo-daro and Kalibangan show certain uniformity in their planning. These cities were divided into citadel on the west side and a lower town on the eastern side of the settlement. The average citizen seems to have lived in the blocks of houses in the lower city. Here too, there are variations in the sizes of houses. It could be a single room meant for people who were involved in various works and there could be houses complete with courtyards and having up to 12 rooms. The bigger houses were provided with private wells also. These houses had much of the plan which was basically related to a square courtyard around which there were number of rooms. The entrances to the houses were from the narrow lanes which cut the street at right angles. However, during those times, no windows faced the street. This meant that the roadward facing of the houses would be like a row of brick walls. Learners, traditional architecture has evolved over generation in response to the local climate, topography, culture and context. It employs locally available natural material and indigenous construction techniques. So along with sustainability, it has a cost effectiveness also and a strong aesthetic character. So we find that this architecture is so beautiful and so well designed that today many of such places are prominent attractions as far as local tourists are concerned. So now let us 
look into uh, the kind of material that we used in those times as far as the housing was concerned. Traditional architecture employed locally sourced natural material as they were easily available economically also and also climatically they were more suitable. Also they had a very low carbon footprint due to negligible transportation cost. Such material also harmonizes well with the natural environment of the location. So we have stone, bricks, mud, wood, lime and thatch which were most widely used material depending upon the availability in a particular region. Since time immemorial how homes have been used basically for number of activities which were related to social in nature. In the construction technique we use stones for building walls, roofs and floors. Stone is strong and durable in addition to being available in a wide range of appealing colors, grains and textures. It was advisable uh, to use stones especially in the hilly regions of Himachal, sandstone in Rajasthan and according to the nature of the soil different types of soil uh, stones were selected. Mud and bricks have been used in buildings since ancient time. Mud is one of the most eco-friendly material available for building. Sun-dried bricks also fall in the same category. Burnt bricks have added strength and a concept of permanent nature that made them popular since the time of early civilization. Brick building and structure have stood for centuries which bear a testimony to their durability. So learners we find that bricks were widely used for construction even today, building with muds however has become obsolete. Some of the organizations are trying to revive the use of mud in contemporary architecture. However, it depends upon the time of uh, the construction, the place and the location which actually influences the factors in the selection of the construction technique. Lime was used in the building before the advent of cement. Lime mortar and plastic can you know actually save consumption of cement without loss of any strength. Lime wash is also healthy and it is an organic option for painting instead of using synthetic paints. So we find a wide kind of variations for example in northeastern states of India bamboo has been used for making traditional houses whereas uh, bamboo is lightweight but it is suitable for a region because it, the region may experience frequent earthquakes. Bamboo has lot of potential as it is a grass that grows up very quickly and possesses amazing strength and flexibility. Learners. Uh, we have enough evidences from the past that wood was used mainly for doors and windows and in some regions for building the structure. Even today at home we use wood as it contributes uh, to the overall beautification of the house. However, with the new technologies that are coming up and the problems related to deforestation, a lot of new variations are coming up so that we can come up with the construction style which is eco-friendly. Now let us go back to the traditional Indian home layout. Uh, internal courtyard was an integral part of the layout. It provided ample natural light and ventilation to the home interiors known as Angan in Hindi, Varra in Punjabi. It is a space where a lot of family activities took place in complete privacy. In many homes the courtyard was flanked by corridors and verandas from which the various rooms could be accessed. These places also provided shade and kept the house out of rain. Some homes had more than one courtyard. The courtyard played a very important role in maintaining thermal comfort and natural ventilation in the interiors. It functioned as a connecting thermostate protecting the house from the extremes of temperature. Dust storms would pass over the residence with little impact and it also helped to create a pleasant environment by bringing nature into the home. Another important part of the residential architecture is the jalis or the screen that is widely used in traditional architecture for ventilation, light, shade and privacy. These scenes let in the cool breeze but kept out the harsh sun and the dust. 
they form interesting patterns with light and shadow the hawa mahal in jaipur was built for women of the royal family to see the activities of the street below especially ceremonial processions in complete privacy and comfort the entire facade is made up of intricate jali work in with reference to sandstone mughal architecture also made use of beautiful jalis in marble and sandstone for palaces and pavilions using jalis along with water feature was extremely effective in reducing the summer heat therefore even today lot of architects use jalis in their designs and have experimented with various forms of jalis such as brick jalis in number of projects another important aspect of a traditional home in india was the veranda it is covered and and partially enclosed structure attached to the house traditional homes usually had a veranda at the entrance to receive guests these provided shade and kept the house outside the preview of the hot sun the veranda forms the transitional space between the home interior and the external environment and thereby connected the house with the nature uh, we find for example in traditional kerala homes in addition to the front verandas we have verandas on the side also they protect the house from the summer heat and heavy monsoon rains verandas next to courtyard provided cool and shaded space for various family activities and social interaction the roof of the veranda was supported by a series of columns that were beautifully carved in wood or sandstone therefore experiencing some activity or performing social activities at the veranda provided a pleasant experience another important local term that is used in residential architecture is known as chhajjas they are projections over window and door openings to protect them from sun and rain they may be slopy or horizontal and can form a protection all around the openings like a jharoka in rajasthani architecture due to the shade provided by the chhajjas on the opening they contribute to the reduction of heat entering the interior of the house in the tropical climate sloping overhangs have been traditionally employed to keep out of the heavy monsoon rain similarly these chhajjas are used in the area also where we receive heavy snowfall chhajjas provide shade and protection from rain sometimes separate chhajja was not required and the cave of the sloping roof provided and the protection of opening below it so it's again an architectural element that added a lot of interest to the exteriors with the projections and the shadows they cast in case of rajasthan it is jaisalmer which is known for its architecture in yellow sandstone with jharokas and jalis as the main architectural element another important part of residential architecture architecture is arches Arches are beautifully designed features that are rarely used in today's home. Arches lend a lovely charm due to their soft curves that provide a welcome change from the straight lines and right angles. Arches also offer the advantage of being structurally stable due to their form. So they were constructed and were used over doors and window openings also. they could be made in brick or stone therefore saving the amount of concrete that is used and they really looked appealing in corridors and verandas along with this one interesting feature of residential architecture is sloping roofs sloping roofs have been employed in areas receiving heavy heavy rainfall and snowfall they are uh, basically mostly found in southern states where we experience heavy monsoon rains they were usually covered with terracotta tiles and the elegant mangalore tiles are most famous in this context in the mountain of northern india sloping roofs are made up of stone tiles like slate these natural tiles and the sloping roof added to the aesthetic appeal of the home the sloping roof had an elaborate supporting structure and at times we find that it helped in getting better light inside the home along with this we had built in furniture that was used while constructing the house in kerala homes uh, we have built in seating in front verandas 
it was used by the family members for entertaining guests we had few wooden swings in the verandas of south indian homes as well so we had shelves and cupboards for storage and displays they were also used to keep the diyas or lanterns at night as they would not get blown away by the wind the built-in furniture was extremely durable and was saved on the wood work so we have these uh, furniture which was basically planned at the time of the construction of the house there are changes in the technology of residential housing and we find lot of new forms of residential architecture from 13th century ad mostly they were palaces of kings and nobles uh, the most spectacular palace architecture is that of rajputs they had lot of experience and they were familiar with the local soil the material available as well as they extended lot of patronage to provide good architectural form and develop grand palaces apart from these palaces of rulers there was an elaborate description of private houses or havelis of the rich which we find in terms of the rajasthani architecture however you find them in many places for example in jaipur as jaisalmer jodhpur the early surviving mansion of jaisalmer the, the ground floor has no more than a heavy panel door and upper one with broad balconies carried an elaborate bracket between the two uh, scenes with the some sort of a terrace above the characteristic feature is extremely fine jali work in gold colored sandstone and sandstone was used with timber so that the overall atmosphere can be pre- preserved now let me discuss some more aspects of these havelis first of all we had the socio cultural aspect where the chowk or the courtyard served as a center of ceremonies and rituals the holy tulip plant was placed there and worshiped daily to bring prosperity to the home the the chowk from time to time divided the area for men and women by enabling them more privacy these havelis were built according to the local climate air circulation was caused was caused by temperature changes throughout and the natural ventilation of the building was well developed the use of the house was basically by the women who performed lot of jobs related to household activities and the material that was used was baked brick sandstone marble wood and granite and they were decorated with paints by according to the local culture and traditions so all these elements come together f- give us a sense of rule and security the architectural design of haveli construction has evolved in response to climate lifestyle and availability of material in hot climate the building was having more what uh, water storage as well as air circulation and we had high walls around them for protection many of the havelis that are found in the northern india are influenced by rajasthani architecture they usually contain a yard often with a centralized place uh, the old towns of agra lucknow and delhi lahore multan and hyderabad also have many examples of architectural havelis now in terms of the havelis we find that you find and that this concept was well developed by the vaishnava sects also and we find that havelis in gujarat are also remarkable for their paintings image of gods and animals and also some of them depict the scenes of british colonization also these uh, havelis were used by large individual dwellings who had huge family and between 1830 to 1930 the marble buildings came up in a big way the the marble buildings were painted and were heavily influenced by the mughal architecture they were symbol of homes for large families they provided security and comfort and it was a closed system where which had a major 
gateway. Now from the tourism point of view, the Havelis in Shikhavati region of Rajasthan are still popular for cultural tourism. These Havelis are maintained usually under the Government of India Heritage Hotel Promotion Scheme. The towns and villages of Shekhavati are famous for their beautiful painting work on the magnificent Havelis, which is an important tourist attraction. Along with this, as I shared with you, the Havelis in and around Jaisalmer and Jodhpur are also very impressive and are a part of tourist attraction. They are basically refined houses of wealthy merchants of Jaisalmer or an adjoining area. We find extravagant sculpture with reference to sandstone and a lot of paintings on these structures. So, they are characterized again by fiescos in balconies or jharokas. After understanding the, Raj, the Rajput style of architecture, let us now move to the architecture that had emerged during the time of the British. Several European powers such as British, Dutch, Portuguese and French invaded India and introduced their native style of architecture to the region they ruled. The influence of the Portuguese style of architecture could be identified in the evolution of housing typology of Goa and Daman and Diu, which was basically made up of the various influences of the European region. The houses were painted and the color was made up of natural dyes. Uh, the residential area also exhibit large porches. Uh, the French had established their society in Pondicherry and some other parts of Malabar coast and parts of West Bengal. They used local resources and material for construction took into consideration the climatical conditions of this site and supplemented the composition with their native style of architecture. So, we have a franco tamilian housing style. The Dutch influence was mild as compared to the Portuguese and the French and could be found in the parts of Kerala and Gujarat. We had extensive timber framework, tilted sloping roof and open verandas. However, a major shift in the evolution of housing and settlement in the country took place during the British rule because of the changes in the trade system and new cultural settings. Initially, uh, the Britishers introduced their conventional bungalow, a one storied structure built from brick and given a white plaster finish having a sloping roof. The bungalows were also used for housing to be provided to government workers and people higher in the hierarchy in the British administration. Later with the increase in trade there was also a development in the infrastructure as we find that new cities emerged such as Mumbai, Chennai and Calcutta which led to the growth of urbanization. We know that there is a large scale migration of people from rural areas to these cities for better job opportunities and lifestyle. As a result of it, we needed more residential spaces. So, the open spaces and the verandas around the bungalow started lessening and the, the length and the width of the bungalow also was limited. So, we came up with an apartment system and I think you all are aware about multi-storied apartments today. Some of you probably live in these apartments and they are influenced by the Indo Gothic or the modern style of architecture. Along with this, uh, we have number of colonies which are built up by the government and they are maintained by the government for the middle income group of the society and also for the various other groups of the society, the government is coming up with its plan for developing housing or residential architecture in a sustainable way. In such cities such as Mumbai where you have lot of rural migration, the concept of chawl, a housing typology known as uh, an area where number of people could live together in a khole or a room uh, for, as a tenant connected by a single passage on one side of the structure and having shared sanitation facilities per floor. So, we find lot of changes today in the building architecture of India. We are 
focused on generating new housing facilities for the citizens. The government has also come up with various schemes and are giving subsidy to the people. So the old system of residential architecture is slowly now getting away and with the advancement of technology and development of industry, we have a new concept of industrial townships which are emerging up. These townships provide facilities for housing of workers of the industry which relate to their hierarchy of work and they also provide essential facilities such as schools, markets, recreation spaces and gathering areas. So learners, I hope that from this video you have understood that the housing architecture of India, the residential buildings of India have undergone a major change. On the one hand, in the early period, we find more durable housing structure. During the medieval period, we find that the concept of Havili was very much prominent with its specific features. And during the time of British period, we had the bungalows, which you find them at major hill stations of India. Residential architecture is a form of tourism attraction. Whenever we visit a new city, we would like to visit a place which is associated with famous personalities of that particular region. Many of such havelis or bungalows are also taken over by government and are developed into many museums so that the local tourist and the global tourist can visit the destination and experience its cultural diversity. Thank you.